Hello everybody, it's Dr. Rick uh, dropping in on you. Hope everybody has had a great week. Uh, look, I'm not going to uh, do a whole lot of beating around the bush. I'm going to jump right into this. Uh, number one is we're asking uh, those who really truly believe in what we do to give. I know you hear me say that all the time, but I'm saying it uh, because it seems that no one's hearing it. Uh, literally, uh, support is, I mean... For all, imp for all purpose, non existing. And I want to talk to you why, I'll talk to you about why it's important. I want to take you on a journey over the course of my, my life in brief synopsis, but to give you an idea of what's been done over the last 35 plus years and the work that's come out of it and what needs to be done. See, it's easy to talk about black empowerment, it's easy to sit up and assume that it's a natural order and consequence of simply being black and alive that at some point life is just going to come back to us and we're going to reclaim our glory and all of this. But when you d look at it from a historical perspective, when you study the great minds who have visited this challenge in the past, and you look at the people who alone in in inspired me to be and do what I be, be who I am and do what I do, and you look at it and say, okay, we're still where we are right now, it should create ate a dim and bleak picture uh, and really should wake you up to the urgency of what's going on right now and what we need to do as a people. So I, I, I want to, you got to think about it. Just think about it. I'm going to talk about some people, but I, I, I want to show you what we've done in 35 years and why so much more goes undone and what needs to be done. If you're serious about black empowerment, if you're serious about creating safer environments for our children, if you're serious about lowering the femicide rate, if you're serious about mental health for black men and empowering black men to actually be in a position to do what we want and expect black men to do with an understanding of so many things that are working against that and in many times us. But let, let, let's talk about it. See, I've always been this kid who was plot proud to be who I was. I never aspired to be anything but me. Uh, I never saw anyone else as being better than me, but I had people around me who nurtured that idea that nobody's better than you and that you're gonna have to go out into this world and actually be better than a bunch of people who don't look like you just to get your foot in the door because they have certain advantages just by the color of their skin. I was told that, but I was also immediately told that you're capable of being better. You're capable of showing up and delivering in a way that nobody can. So you're going to be fine if you show up. So I decided to show up. But one day, uh, leaving school early, I came home and turned on the television and the Phil Donahue show was on. And on this Phil Donahue show, it was 1985, on this Phil Donahue show was this black woman with this afro and her name was Frances Cress Welsing and she was defending her Cress theory of color confrontation uh, amongst several white quote unquote scholars. Now to understand that she would have had to have been a person who was aware and educated at least some level on what was going on in the mid 80s for this to really have true significant meaning. Number one, this isn't now, this is in the 80s and it's literally several years on the heels of a push by mainstream and especially the world of academia to push this black infer inferiority idea that because white students tended to test about 15 points higher on IQ tests. That meant that they were inherently smarter than blacks. And uh, I've rebutted that on a scientific level since, but this is Dr. Welsey, a black woman holding her own in a room full of academics who's challenging her theory on a scientific level and she's giving them the business. Now at this time, I am teetering is, you know, I'm teetering on whether I'm going to be an attorney 
or whether I'm going into the field of psychology. Those were the things I were passionate about. Those are the things I seen fit for because I love to talk. I love to debate. I love to sit up and dig into stuff to learn it. And But I loved human understanding human behavior, why people do what people do. And after watching that, it was a done deal. Psychology it was. And so here we go. We often, and, and through Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, I came across Neely Fuller Jr. And from Neely Fuller Jr., Dr. Amos Wilson, from Amos, Dr. Amos Wilson, Dr. Naeem Akbar, and, and, and on down the line, uh, your do, Dr. Jordan Grise, your Dr. Howard Stevenson's, your Dr. Khaled Muhammad's, your Dr. Claude Anderson's, and, and, and all of these people had massive impacts on how I view things, and they, they pushed the challenge uh, that I had given myself to understand this thing, but not only understand it, be a catalyst for solving some of the issues. And so what I decided to do is I started to uh, look into some things. And one of the first things I looked into was multi-generational trauma. This is where I crossed uh, sectioned with Dr. Joy DeGray and Dr. Howard Stevens, I would lay the cross-section with them again in the study of African-American adolescent and young adult male violence, but that's another thing. So I'm studying this, and and here's the thing that, uh, and, and here's the thing I'm going to actually, in the description box where I'm asking you to look in there, look in there and give. The work we're doing is beyond necessary. It's not sensational. It's not nothing that anybody's going to look at and it's glittering and it's, it's exciting and it's, you know, it's, it's work that needs to be done. You know why the enemy is studying us. The enemy has more scientific data on us than we have on ourselves. The enemy knows how to trigger us. The enemy knows what to do to keep us at bay. The enemy knows what to do to ensure that our generations that follow us won't gain any ground. That's a reason why the uh, way the racial wealth gap is widening between white and blacks. You have to understand that. You can't just sit up and complain about it. You can't sit up and say, well, I'm not getting an opportunity. You got to understand what mechanisms are being used. How many times have you heard me say that one of the biggest problems we have is we don't understand how things work? Well, my, 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 my passion was to understand how things work. So I decided uh, I was going to take on this argument. At the time, uh, I think it was 130 years. Right now, it's 150 plus years since slavery, right? 150 what? 158, something like that. Somewhere along the line, my mouth is off right now. My mind is really focused on doing what I'm doing here. But it's 150-something years since slavery, right? But at the time, it was 132 years, I believe, when I first started this. And the argument was, it's been 130 years. Get over it. Slavery's been over. Now, you never hear Jews say, get over it. You can't tell a Jew to get over it. They're going to remember it. But something that I learned in studying this was that really stuck in my mind is that while Jewish people will not let you tell them to forget the Holocaust, they're not going to forget it. They are going to rally around it. It's their bedrock. But the difference is they don't call themselves victims. They call themselves survivors. Something as simple as that is powerful, but I'll get into that a little later or at another time. But anyway, so I started to look into that and I studied it and, and ultimately what I first came across was the world of epigenetics. And in this description box, I'm going to leave a link to a, a paper I wrote. This is a 400-page um, thesis uh, on the suffrage of our people and the passing down of generational trauma that I never turned into a book. I'm giving you the link to this. It's in a digital flip book form, so many you can open it up in your browser and literally flip the pages through it and read it. It's 400 plus pages of what I came up with, but it's it's entitled The Cries of My People, The Search for Healing Amid the Suffering of the Black Race. But it's talking about how generational trauma is passed down epigenetically. It's talking about the microaggressions and the environmental stressors that are causing long-term uh, physical uh, ailments. And it, it, it was the uh, it, it was the initial in introduction into epigenetics, but I will see epigenetics again when I started to started to study adverse childhood experiences and how they impact long term life out uh, health outcomes for children who are born up in environments with matter of fact, born up in environments with uh, certain stressors. This is a workshop that I did for Wellsprings uh, Clinical. 
uh, practice, which is run by a friend of mine, Dr. David Jones, and the Harris County Sheriff's Office, which has a reentry program where they work with the families of inmates who are on short-term sentences and coming back in. Uh, and, and, and I'll talk about incarceration another time. But they wanted me to do um, a workshop on epigenetics and to explain to them why these 10, why these 10 adverse experiences, each one counts as a, a, a point on the ACE score chart, why they have long-term implications in regular health outcomes, uh, how a child with four or more ACEs is two and a half more times to develop uh, uh, diabetes, four and a half times more likely to develop ischemic, ischemic heart disease, um, 12 times more likely to attempt suicide. And I can go on and on of these different things that are outcomes that you can track and are consistent with these ACEs, which is a part of epigenetics. Why? Because it's the environmental stressors that are placed upon the system and they're overly emphasized in young minds and young bodies because they're still developing and they haven't developed a resistance or the ability to cope with high levels of stress over time. And so that's that part of it. But what we did is we put that together. So I want you to read that 400 page um, essay, thesis, whatever you want to call it, that I did on uh, epigenetics, on how it's causing us to pass down trauma, what an epigenetic tag is, gene up regulation, gene, gene down regulation, uh, gen, DNA uh, uh, transcriptions and all this stuff and how it's playing out in our lives. Nobody's taking the time to look at that, but the Jews did. That's where I got it from. The Jews knew that going through that type of traumatic experience for 12 years is what they went through it with, had done something to them. And they were, they, they were determined to get to the bottom of it. So they invested in research. It was the research they invested in that triggered my study and deeper look into epigenetics and the studying of, of unbelievable juggernauts in the area of trauma like Dr. Basil van der Kolk uh, in understanding all these things. And that's just in the area of trauma. Then there was uh, special education disproportionality among black boys. I wrote two books on education, specifically The Miseducation of Black Youth in America, my 16th book, and Academic Apartheid, my uh, 24th book. And both of those books focus heavily on the way that our children are being purposely miseducated. Malcolm told us, without question, that only a fool expects his enemies to educate his children to compete against theirs. But yet we consistently send our children off to school. I talked about this the other day when we were talking about this young lady and this substitute teacher getting into a no quarrel over a phone. Uh, the issue is so much bigger than that phone. The biggest, the issue is so much bigger than what's going on between that substitute teacher and that kid. The problem is we are trusting a system that's not designed for us to work for us. It's actually designed to hold us back. The entire system is set up for them to advance in it and, 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 and for us not to. And even with them advancing in it, if they don't have someone at home teaching them the real primary elements and components of building, they won't have it. They'll be worker bees. They'll just be working at a high level, getting paid more. And that's how they're stretching and, and widening the gap. But here's the thing. We didn't stop there. This research sit up and put me in a situation. I wrote a position paper. I challenged the system. I connected people with Dr. Umar Johnson, who everybody derides, who everybody said this, but what I can tell you personally is that I've sent people to this brother who is a certified and licensed school psychologist. School psychology is in my area of specialty, but I knew that there was an issue. And so it's so hard once they refer your kid and he gets on the IP of 504 and then you're trying to get them off and it's hard. But they have to have your permission to put them on. So you need to understand all these things, but our people don't. And we get hemmed up. Why? Because we don't understand how things work. And you got someone who has literally put their whole life into making sure you understand. That's why the 26 books, uh, published books come from. I got probably 10 books shelved. The one that you're going to read here is going to eventually become a book. I just haven't determined how I'm going to put it together, how I'm going to... Uh, structure it, but it's all there. 
Anywhere. Okay, so then we go to African American adolescent and young adult male violence. Here we go crossing paths again with Dr. Joy DeGruy and Dr. Howard Stevenson and others in understanding why so many black males are turning it violent on one another and turning violent on family members, turning violent in the community, and how it also ends up turning into intimate partner violence and intimate partner homicide. We love to deride and talk about, oh, how evil somebody is and how bad someone is, but what we first have to ask ourselves is, were they born that way? No, only 1% or less than 1% of our population, male population, is born uh, as psychopaths. That means that even sociopathic behavior is primarily developed early or early in life. So very few are born with the inability to have a conscious or inability to feel a, 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 just a natural penchant to be self-serving and basically what most people will consider evil. So that means what people become is a primary result of their experiences, primary result of what their environment presents to them and what they figure to work out. And when you disrupt an entire community ecosystem by destroying the family, by incarcerating fathers, by uh, economically castrating men, we are the lowest earners among mm -hmm. all the men, even as, and so, so before you go and buy into the narrative and the rhetoric that they love to push, that we go all out repeating without understanding the science behind it. This is why I do what I do, because we need to understand what's going on. So here we go. They'll sit up and tell you we're lazy. No, we actually work hard. They'll sit up and tell you we're not good fathers. Science actually tells us. CDC has even had to write a report and, and acknowledge that black fathers are the most involved Black fathers are most likely to actually financially support their children, but they're not going to show you us. They're going to show you the deadbeat dad. They're going to show you the guy that beats his girlfriend. They're going to show you the guy that's robbing the bank. They're not going to show you the other 90-something percent of the population that's getting it in and doing what they're supposed to do and caring about the people in their lives because that doesn't serve the narrative. We need you to not trust black men. We need you to see black men as the most dangerous thing on the earth when actually we're the most protective, but we still have a problem because far too many of our women are being harmed by black men. Relatively speaking, to me, one sister being harmed by a black man is too many. But when we look at it in the grand scope of things, the vast majority of our men aren't the ones perpetuating those crimes. But we're not going to get any airtime. That's not the image they want to portray. So we got to look at all of the, why that's happening and going on. But when I'm studying African-American, adolescent, young adult male violence, there is this discovery of five primary elements and components that influence African-American, adolescent, and young adult male violence. Five. The top five. Number five, urban hassle. What's urban happening? Urban hassle is all the things that the average inner city kid has to deal with that most kids probably won't. Uh, gunshots in the middle of the night, sirens in the middle of the night, having to navigate gun violence and uh, gang activity, get to and from school. If you're in the Midwest or the, or, or the Northeast, L trains all over the place, making all the noise as they travel by. All of that stuff is an agitating thing that literally puts their neurological system on edge. You got to understand that your neurological system isn't meant to deal with so many different infringements. Do you realize there's a reason why a baby, without knowing anything about what they should be afraid of and not afraid of, there's a reason why when you drop a book and it makes a loud noise, they jump? It's in the neurological system. It's triggered. They are naturally triggered to be instinctively protective. So when you constantly have something that's triggering their nerves, their neurological system is being put on edge. You're making them more likely to respond to something in an agitated manner. You got to also understand that there's a natural instinctive mechanism within males as they go into puberty when testosterone starts to produce itself where they are going to be more edgy. They are meant to be that way. It's that edginess and aggression in them that's meant for them to be willing to to fight to, to the point of death to defend what they're supposed to be protecting. But when they don't have the right guidance, when they don't have the right direction, when they don't have the right modeling, when they don't have the right structure, that goes haywire. That goes unchecked. It goes unguided. And so it gets misdirected and aimed at the wrong thing. But that's just number five. Number four is witnessing violence. You see violence over and over again. You become desensitized to it. It doesn't have the same feeling. You know, so Becky out in, uh, uh, let's use a, a, a male name, Todd, little, little, little Todd, little Cody, uh, out in, 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 in the suburbs, doesn't see violence. So 
when they see a punch thrown, it's, oh, my God. My God, why? We see punches thrown all the time. No big deal. It's a fight. You watch the fight. I mean, I grew up in the hood. Watch the fight. Fight over it. Everybody go back to playing basketball. No big deal. But neurologically, psychologically, emotionally, it's planting a seed. It's teaching a behavior. It's teaching when something doesn't go your way, you hit. Not to mention that your parents are in the house whooping your ass every time that you don't do what they say do. I wonder where we get that from. Another time. But what happens is that hap you, 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 you have a tendency to become desensitized. Then the next one, number three, is being a victim of violence. Being a victim of violence makes you even more inclined to become violent. Again, it's a form of desensitization. Number two is my sweet spot, and I love it. Lack of, rac lack of proper racial socialization. It is the one spot and place that you can have the most impact because you can create programs and systems to do it. Number one, the feeling of being disrespected. The least one to control because you can't determine what each kid defines as respect because that isn't a universal idea because we don't have that kind of structure in our community. But we can go back and say, let's start creating the structure through racial socialization. What is racial socialization? Racial socialization is one of the most powerful instruments you can have to create racial identity, which is absolutely necessary in a system that recognizes race. So what do I mean by that? Racial socialization. So every parent socializes their kid. Everybody socialized in some kind of way. Okay, uh, the average parent socializes their kids. You're beautiful. You're smart. You, you can do anything you want to, blah, 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 all that good stuff. Send them out in the world. The world says, hey, you're so cute. You're so smart. You can do everything in the world. And so it's reinforced. Problem is with black kids, parents says, you're smart. You're beautiful. You can do anything in the world. You go out. The world says, your nose is too big. Your hips are too wide. Your hair is too nappy. Black, me black males at five years old, I've already been told, you can't learn. You're going to special education. You're too slow. You're too dumb. You're too stupid. And so over and over again. So then what does do black parents have to racially socialize? What does that mean? I'm going to socialize you and tell you all those beautiful things. And I'm about to come back and double down and tell you, because you're black, this is going to happen. But, but, but because you're black, you're beautiful. There's a beautifulness in who you are. Never be afraid of being black. Your hair is gorgeous. Your your nose is fine. Your, 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 your The way you move, the way you speak, your language is fine. All of these things. Why? Because the world is going to immediately come upon you and tell you that all that stuff makes you less it's going to create an inferiority complex within you that is going to make you want to aspire to be like them you're going to want your hair to be like them you don't want your nose to be like them you're going to want so much of you to be like what they are because they define what beauty is they define what professional is they define what class is they define all these different things and so what happens i want to be like the people who are in power, who are defining things. We gotta learn how to define our own selves and find power within ourselves, racial socialization. What we found with racial socialization is that when we racially socialize a kid, uh, a black male, not only does his inclinations or propensities towards violence decrease drastically, he becomes more focused, he becomes um, more centered, he does better in school, he ends up uh, creating a situation where he trains better and becomes a better wage earner. He is more likely to become a business owner and he's also more likely to marry a black woman and sustain a black family. These are the numbers. This is the research. It's there. But we have to actually do it. That's why I created Black Men Lead, a rite of passage initiative that is designed to create a universal idea of what black manhood is, train young black men what they should and should not be doing. The number one principle in black man lead is that a black man never brings harm to a black female under no circumstances. The next one is a black man earns his wage. The next one is a black man does not make excuses. And we go on down the line, but we train them how to lean in each other. And the one thing we get, we get rid of that bull crap about men don't cry, real men don't cry. 
Real men don't feel. We feel. We just know how to manage our emotions. We don't act out of our emotions. We respond to our emotions and we make decisions based on our leadership. We make decisions based on the calmness and, and ability to respond to things versus react to it. We got to stop the reactiveness that's going on with our young black males. But I, I, I came up. I put the work out. I did the research. I created the programs. They work. I just can't reach enough people to make a massive impact. I love the work I'm doing with the kids that I work with. I love the way that I'm sharing and helping other people. And I'm gonna do whatever I can until I'm, I'm, I'm no longer able to do it. But it's out there to be done. And it's nobody going to do it but us. Nobody's going to come in and fund something that actually works. They'll put millions in the bull crap that doesn't work just to say they put millions into it so that they can turn around and say they just don't want to. Or they can't. This is just who they are. No, it's not. You knew that there were certain elements and components not present in this program that were integral parts of this program, linchpins, part, linchpins in this program that ensured that they would be successful. You removed them. So on the surface, it looks good. And they do this to us over and over again, and we bite on it. I pointed out that's more research. I, I did research on serial force displacement. I did that all the way back from redlining, benign neglect, urban renewal, gentrification. All of these are forms of serial force, force displacement. We are currently, we are constantly being pushed out of spaces and dispersed. And it's not just an economic issue. It is an economic issue, but it's not just an economic issue. It's a psychological issue. It's a sociological issue. It has even had health. A big part of the spread of the HIV epidemic in the 80s was due to serial force displacement, scientifically proven. Especially in the Northeast when you're talking about New York, Philly, all up in there. Serial force displacement. Now they're gentrifying Harlem. They done gentrified Harlem. And we don't understand. And so we just constantly complain instead of coming up with active mechanisms and strategies and agendas that allow us to be responsive to the aggression that we can see. We just want to complain. When you see us burning shit up, tearing stuff up, marching with signs, that's a reaction and it comes from a sense of powerlessness. People throw tantrums when they don't have the ability to change something. Once a child gets to an age where they can really figure out, well, I can go do this, or I can literally tell her this, or I can work mom this way, they stop throwing tantrums and they resort to something more civilized, more effective. They get away from it because what they realize is the good parent steps right over you while you land on their kicking ground. I, number one is eventually you're going to do one of two things. You're going to get tired of crying or you're going to fall asleep. Either way, I'm good. That's the same way they look at us when we run around with them picket signs. Picket signs don't mean jack shit if you don't have economic power in which you can execute economic sanction, which you can sit up and hurt their pocketbooks when you can make them uncomfortable. That, that, that picket sign means nothing. It amounts to a collective temper tantrum. You've got to have an agenda. I've been talking about this forever. But we Then I talked about the War of Black Wealth. Walker wrote a book on that. Created an organization, Legacy Wealth Academy. Did 10 years worth of research with the top investors in the world on how to build wealth, whether they give you a dime or not. Put that in a course. You know who want to take it? Not us. We're not the ones signing up for it. And I'm going like, <laughs> and you know how many times that happens? I set something up for us and I particularly set it up and price it for us. And they jump on it like, like it's pancakes. And we sitting back looking at it frowning. And it's, it's like, we are so far behind the eight ball in just awareness and knowledge. You cannot take on a system that's designed to destroy you from inside the system.
You've got to be willing to move outside the confines, but you got to understand the rules. You got to understand. See, again, they can't have more data on you than you have on yourself. But that's the case right now because nobody's back in research. The Harvest Institute with Dr. Claude Anderson, the Vision, I mean, the Odyssey Project with me. You got a bunch of other people that are doing it for uh, for uh, academic institutions, Dr. Jordi Gray, Dr. Harvard Steven, uh, Dr. Howard Stevenson at University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Jordi Gray at the University of Portland, um, Dr. Naeem Akbar is doing his own thing. Uh, but as far as think tank wise, very few. They got 1,300 think tanks. They got think tanks for almost everything you're looking at. For academics, that's a think tank. For real estate, that's a think tank. For prison uh, uh, manipulation and incarceration and all that. And, and I did research on that. Incar mass incarceration and recidivism. Did a whole entire program on how to lower recidivism. It's not just that they are incarcerating our boys. You want to know what happens when we sit up and we allow our kids to be alienated, our young boys to be alienated as early as five years old with this disproportionality of special education referrals? They become disenfranchised with the system. They don't trust the system. They're not happy in the system. They drop out. You know what happens when they drop out? They become five times more likely to become incarcerated. You know what happens when they become incarcerated? They get caught up in the system, become socialized into that system. We call it institutionalized, but it's really socialized into an environment and a behavior that is conducive to returning. That's why the recidivism rate is over 70%. 70% 70 of Incarcerated individuals return within three years or reoffend and return within three years. We have 1.5 million men missing. One of the reasons it's hard to model manhood and the reason for black men lead and rite of passage initiatives. 1.5 million missing. 1.3 are in prison. And, and, and here's the crazy thing. One of the 10 adverse childhood experiences or ACEs is having a parent that's incarcerated. This cycle is beastly. And we're getting our ass kicks because we want to sit idly by and think it's going to fix itself. We don't have an appreciation for the people who put in the work. We don't have appreciation for knowledge outside of saying, hey, man, that's good. I thank you for sharing. Do you realize the sacrifice that goes in to doing this? And this isn't this this one page uh, for, with a list isn't even close to the work I've done. I'm just not going to sit here for hours and hours and go over the things I've done. But then after that, then we talk about how many times have you talk, heard me talk about restoring the black family? The black family is the nucleus for the foundation. It's where we inculcate into the psyche and the minds and the state of being and the existence of our children, our values, our interests, and our principles. You got to understand, when they brought us over here, the way that they actually enslaved us wasn't the chains. Because if you realize, most of us weren't on chains. Uh, most of our ancestors weren't on chains when they were on the plantation. Why would, they, why would the vast majority stay? Despite the conditions, despite... Almost all of them wanting to be free. Why would they stay? They have been robbed of their values, their interests, their principles, which are essential elements and components of self-identity. They had been, their names have been taken, their history had been taken, their God and the way they viewed God had been disrupted. Um, and then, even if you could sit up for those who sit up and say, "Well, Christianity existed before slavery," and it did. And it had made its way into Africa before uh, the transatlantic slave trade. What you got to understand is the vision and view of Jesus wasn't what they were seeing here. Let me tell you something. Anytime that you have an oppressor and your oppressor's God is the God that's given you, but their God looks like them, that's a problem. Have you ever traveled the world? If you've ever traveled the world, one of the things that really truly opened me up is as I traveled the world, everywhere I went, their God looked like them. We're the only people on this planet who don't have a God that we can relate to on a superficial optic level. So when we look at their God subconsciously, 
that Caucasian God says those Caucasians are more godly because they are a reflection of him. Now, the truth of the matter historically and all that stuff, we're not going to get into it, but you got to understand that's what we were given. So since, since, since that's what we were given, then we have to come back and we have to look and we'll say, okay, how do we do this? Well, the way that they the way that they made it impossible was they saw that we were building. They saw that even though they had took us through, at that time, 246 years of slavery when they released us, despite 12 years of reconstruction, despite black codes, despite convict leasing, despite 70 plus years of Jim Crow segregation, despite redlining, benign neglect, urban renewal, mass incarceration, miseducation, we were still building. We had our own theaters, we have our own cab companies, we had on our buses, we were owning our own communities, we were building. They deindustrialized the inner city. Why? Because the manufacturing plants in the inner city, the uh, warehouses in the inner city, allow black men who did not have college degrees to earn livings that allow them to support their family and be the sole provider or the primary source of income in the home. And when they deindustrialized, they de-employed or unemployed black men or underemployed black men. We are still the most underemployed population. We are still the most underpaid. Uh, to make my point, which I was intending to make earlier. A white high school dropout on average earns more than a black man with a college, with a bachelor's. This is not an accident. This is systematic. But if we don't understand it, we allow it to happen. What happened is we participated in a practice that disintegrated our family. And I say that because we played a role. We can't totally blame the system, but we have to understand that we played a role. We allowed ourselves to be split up, torn apart. And don't get me wrong, there's a bunch of things going on in, inside the black community we need to deal with. I've talked about that, I've lectured on that, I've wrote on the enemy within in great detail. So this isn't me making excuses, this is me saying we have to know how to deal with that enemy. And we also have to deal with us but you can't do it without a family. The family is the base. And and the nucleus of the family is the marriage. They attack the hell out of that. We can't stand each other right now. You think that's an accident? No. They studied us. And what they did, now one of the things they did is they commodified the black man. In other words, he solely judged on what he can do financially. His entire other being, which is actually more powerful than what he can do financially, is completely ignored. Can he pay the bills? Should he pay the bills? Yes. But can he pay the bills? Well, when you make him as underpaid, the black man is the only man that his counterpart makes pretty much what he makes on in, uh, earning media. Earning media the black man makes around 44000 The black woman right at forty-three. But when you go into higher incomes, into more fluid uh, professions, she out earns him. You got more six-figure women, black women, than you do six-figure black men. But here's the thing. If you look at social media, you'll think that all the black men out there making six figures because they all got the bags and they all playing all the bills. Now, you can make 60000 and pay all the bills, but you've got to have a woman who buys into the vision that we are not going to overextend ourselves. We're going to take X and do this. We're going to take Y and do this, and we're going to do this with Z until we build our capacity and we grow. Because no matter who you are, whether you got a degree or not, if you make up in your mind you're going to build, you will. But you got to be sitting up and say, hey, yeah, I can, I can cover everything, baby, but this is what, what it would have to look like. I can cover everything if we keep a budget of 40000 a year, 50000 a year. But who's doing that? If the median income for black men is 44000 how many motherfuckers paying the whole bill? Come on. But that's what they got us having conversations about. 
And then we make the black woman the most educated person in the country. She gets more access to education than anybody. Why? Because by herself, no matter how fluid she becomes, no matter how educated, no matter how much money she makes, she can't advance the race by herself. And they know that. They studied us. And she's going to become less and less tolerant of a black man who can't be on her level. So now we're putting the ones who can in different places. He's effective. He can. He's just not going to get the access she gets. So they're both equal in capacity, but not equal in access. And so she looks at him. It's like, if I'm up here, why you can't get up here? And then here's the other problem. Those of us who do get to where we're making six and more, we get the idea that we are all that. And so we lose sight of everything else we need to be outside of money bearers, protectors, spiritual coverings. We are literally the voice and the identity of our children by the sake of what we can see in them before it ever transpires. That's what we do. We are the visual element and component of the representation of God. Women are are the spiritual and the discerning element and component of God. We see, they feel. We were meant to operate as a unit. But they've got us convinced that we don't need to. And so now I don't need a man. And now these women, they, it's, they fought for everything. And so now we're at war. And nobody's when our kids are catching hell while we go at each other. And we haven't prepared them for anything. I talked about that. The miseducation, incarceration. All these things are written on extensively. All these things I've lectured on. All these things I've created programs for. I've put in work. I've been going at this for a long time. I had black hair. And a head full of hair when I started. So when I ask for help, I'm trying to get us to a place. I'm trying to leave a legacy that other bright minds can come along and pick up and take to the next level. We are missing opportunities to advance our race because we are caught up in this idea that we've already arrived. They have a median household wealth of $187,000. We have a median household wealth of 14. Yet, we buy twice as many Mercedes as they do. We spend 2.7, 2. Point something like that billion a year on Jordans. Between October 30th and December 24th, we spend $573 billion. 40-something billion for, for, for Halloween. Why? 50 something billion for uh, Thanksgiving and a whopping 470 something billion for Christmas. And we're struggling economically. We've lost ourselves in the idea we're chasing the American dream when we don't have access to the American pipeline. We need to be building and that's what this is about. So again, I'm challenging you. Give. Everybody who gives will get a link to the with a copy of uh, The Cries for My People, which is a 400-page, uh, basically, dissertation on uh, what I discovered in the way of generational, multi-generational trauma and the uh, transmission of trauma by way of epigenetics. So you can just get a look. You, you, no matter what size your donation, you're going to get that. And I really am hoping that you see the need for this. Um, uh, you know, I'm I'm going to actually take a couple of days, uh, spend some time with my younger ones, um, and, and, and unwind, and I'll check in and everything like this. But I really hope you share this. I really hope you take the time to take this serious. I really hope that you reach into your pockets and give uh, because the research that produced 
these types of things. And while I enjoy doing this for Harris County Sheriff's Department, happens to be the person that's over this is a black major in the Sheriff's Department. Uh, he's new in that particular situation. Uh, the people, it's a new program, so everybody's fired about it, but everybody knows what uh, uh, bu bureaucracy looks like in politics and situations like this. Here's what bothers me about it. I'm going to do whatever I can because my friend is involved in this and, it, and it's his setup with Harris County. And he brought me in to do this because he, in his mind, feels I'm the foremost expert in this field. I've literally lectured in uh, Europe on epigenetics and cancer. And I, I didn't go into it to find anything about cancer, but that's a connection. A lot of the illnesses we're experiencing is coming from our trauma. And we don't understand it from our traumatic environments and we're not doing anything to alleviate it. And they understand it. That I'm worried and stressed to death is real. And they know it. But anyway, here's the problem. When I do a program like this, because it's sponsored by a government agency, guess what I can't do? I can't say it's for black people. I can't stop any other group from coming in. And not that I have a problem working with other kids, but it's a, I have a problem with over-preparing other groups where my group remains unprepared. That's why I like controlling things. So I control where I go, what I do, how I do it. I'm going to do my work the best way I can, but this is what happens. Because I guarantee you there were more people that didn't look like me in this room. But with that being said, look, we need your support. I'm not going to tell you how much money we need you to give. But definitely, we need to do at least 5000 this weekend. Um... And it's time for us to stop passing the buck. What I mean by that? That's his natural proclivity. When you see something, say somebody will give. They'll get it. They'll get it. And you move on. No. The buck stops with you. The buck stops with you. That's something that my grandfather taught me. Thank God for this man who was a son of a sharecropper uh, with a second grade education. He said the, the buck stops with you. Never let the buck pass you. He taught me that. Don't put something off that's, that, that you can do for somebody else because you think it'll get done. It probably will. But you don't let it pass. Don't make it a habit of pass. Now, obviously, you can't give to everything. You can't do everything. But you got to be engaged in something. You got to be giving yourself to something. You got to be overly invested and passionate about something to the point that you can see that it's calling a sacrifice. If you're not sacrificing, you're not living. You're not living up to uh, the challenges of your purpose in this world. So on that note, look, I'm going to leave this. I'm going to get off. I'm going to try to spend the rest of my evening unwinding. I wasn't meant, meaning to be up this freaking late doing this, but it needed to be said. I'm going to get off of here, and I'm going to immediately get this uh, into post-production and get it up before I shut down for the night. So on that note, I'm out of here, you guys. Uh, thank you, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to thank you in advance for giving. On that note, I'm out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They said I should give it up like it. I just ain't good enough. Hello, everybody. Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time you know outside of the businesses that i run like myriad business solutions the visionetics institute odyssey media group i also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in houston dallas and other areas uh, i'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the odyssey project is doing in the inner cities uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, 
uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. I'm free to be free.